looking today at paraneoplastic syndromes. Now this is a heterogeneous group of uh, disorders um, and causes symptoms which are independent of tumor invasion or metastasis, infection, ischemia or the tumor treatment. Now they can occur before, during or after the cancer diagnosis. So that's paraneoplastic syndrome. So around the neoplasm, around the cancer. That's an important word to understand. Okay. So as I said, cause symptoms independent of these things. Now, basically, cancer cell releases cytokines, hormones and antigens, which act on a remote cell and cause specific symptoms. The common cancer associated are the cancer of the lung and the breast ovary adenocarcinomas lymphoproliferative diseases like Hodgkin's these are the ones that are commonly associated now endocrine paraneoplastic syndrome in these the hormones can be produced from utopic or ectopic sources utopic is when there's an expression of a hormone from its normal tissue of origin whereas ectopic is a hormone which is produced from an atypical source okay now this ectopic expression leads to high levels of hormones abnormal regulation of hormone production and peptide processing so these are the common examples of endocrine paraneoplastic syndrome so this is probably the most important takeaway from this video so hyperkalemia hypercalcemia of malignancy syndrome of inappropriate adh secretion cushing syndrome so hypercalcemia of malignancy uh, the hormone secreted is parathormon hormone related peptide okay in CAD it is vasopressin in Cushing's is ACTH and the typical tumors if you uh, look at the tumor types is associated with each of them hypercalcemia of malignancy is a squamous cell of the head neck lung lymphomas lung ovary and then a CAD or syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion is associated with lungs ovary gastrointestinal and genitourinary tumors ACTH by Cushing syndrome um, is associated with usually lung thymus pancreatic and thyroid carcinomas okay so some of the less common ones are non islet cell hypoglycemia male feminization and acromegaly hyperthyroidism hypertension are some of the other ones now, humoral hypercalcemia of malignancy occurs in about 20% of the patients with cancer. Uh, known malignancy, there's a recent onset of hypercalcemia and very high levels of calcium. Now, this may initially be a presenting feature of malignancy and may present with hypercalciuria, hypophosphatemia, suppressed PTH levels, and alkalosis. There's an increased parathormone related peptide in 80%, increased 125 dihydroxy vitamin D in lymphomas. Okay, now Cushing's syndrome is caused by ectopic ACTH production and accounts for 10 to 20 percent of a Cushing syndrome. Squamous cell carcinoma lung cancer is the most common cause. There's a less marked fat gain and centripetal fat redistribution as compared to the other normal Cushing syndrome. There's fluid retention, hypertension, metabolic alkalosis, glucose intolerance, and psychosis. There's increased pigmentation, skin fragility, and easy bruising, and there's severe hypokalemia. If you measure the ACTH levels, they're high, and they do not respond to glucocorticoid suppression. So that's very, very important to understand that they do not respond to glucocorticoid suppression. Okay, so there can be some hematological syndromes as well as part of the paraneoplastic syndromes. So erythrocytosis, granulocytosis, thrombocytosis, eosinophilia, thrombophlebitis can happen. The treatment for these depends upon the underlying presentation. So for erythrocytosis, for example, you can do a successful resection of the cancer which resolves erythrocytosis. Radiation or chemotherapy can help and phlebotomy may control any symptoms related to erythrocytosis. Paraneoplastic granulocytosis does not require the treatment. Isnophilia, and most patients who develop shortness of breath related to isnophilia symptoms resolve with the use of oral or inhaled glucocorticoids. 
Perineoplastic thrombocytosis does not require treatment. Okay. Right, thrombophlebitis, also known as Trotschius syndrome, is a coexistence of peripheral venous thrombosis with with a ca cancer. Okay, so particularly pancreatic cancer. So that's that's very commonly asked in the exams and stuff. So it's a coexistence of peripheral venous thrombosis with a cancer, particularly a pancreatic cancer. So treatment is by unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin for at least five days and then warfarin is started within one to two days. Target INR is two to three. And we continue the warfarin for three to six months or low molecular weight heparin for six months. Now the contraindication to warfarin, uh, to heparin include the placement of filter in the inferior vena cava to prevent pulmonary embolism. So if there is any contraindication, you can use the filter. Okay, so patients with cancer who undergo a major surgical procedure, we should give prophylaxis with heparin or pneumatic boost. Breast cancer patients undergoing chemo and patients with implanted catheters should be considered for prophylaxis. Now, there are also some neurological syndromes as a part of the paraneoplastic syndrome process. 60% precede the cancer diagnosis, but they can occur during or after we diagnose the cancer. But it's only about in 0.5 to 1% of the cancer patients that they are actually clinically disabling. And 2 to 3% of these are with neuroblastoma or small cell lung cancer. 30 to 50% patients with thymoma. Okay. Now, most of the paraneoplastic neurological syndromes are mediated by immune responses, which are triggered by neuronal proteins expressed by the tumors. In paraneoplastic disease, the CNS, many antibody-associated immune responses have been identified. These antibodies react with the patient's tumor and their detention and detection in CRM or CSF usually predicts the presence of cancer. Okay, so these are some of the examples of paraneoplastic syndromes of the nervous system, focal encephalitis cortical limbic brainstem encephalitis, then you have some spinal cord syndromes like motor neuron dysfunction, myelitis, sensory neuropathy, etc. Peripheral nerves can be affected, so you can have vasculitis of the nerves in the muscles, nerve excitabilities, autonomic neuropathy. We've all heard about myasthenia gravis, polymyositis, lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome. So these are some of the examples of classic syndromes which occur with cancer association and then the non-classic syndromes. They're called non-classic because may occur with or without the cancer. Some of the antibodies, which you don't really have to remember too much. Some of the exams may ask these, so you remember the common ones, but not all of them. So approximately half of the patients with sclerotic myeloma develop a sensory mutant neuropathy with predominantly motor deficits. It resembles a chronic inflammatory demyelinating neuropathy and some patients develop elements of Poems syndrome, so which is polyneuropathy, organomegaly, endocrinopathy, M protein and skin changes. Treatment of the plasma cytoma or sclerotic lesions, it usually improves the neuropathy. Okay, so we can also have vasculitis of the nerves and the muscles. It causes a painful symmetric or asymmetric distal sensory motor neuropathy. Affects elderly men predominantly. It's associated with elevated ESR and CSF protein concentration. Squamous cell lung cancer and lymphoma are the primary tumors. You know, glucocorticoids and cyclophosphamides often result in neurological improvement. Then you can also have an ISEX syndrome, which is neuromyotonia or peripheral nerve hyperexcitability, which is a spontaneous and continuous muscle fiber activity of the peripheral nerve region. Clinical features include cramps, muscle twitching, stiffness, delayed muscle relaxation, spontaneous or evoked carpopedal spasms. EMG is diagnostics in these cases, and it usually is seen with thymoma and squamous cell lung cancers. Phenytoin, carbamazepine, and plasma exchange can improve the system. So remember, I6 syndrome, peripheral nerve hyperexcitability.
Okay. Now, wide range of skin disorders can also occur as a part of the perineoplastic syndromes. Um, the underlying mechanism is not clearly known, but is speculated to be cytokines, hormone, or some other growth factors. It can occur again before, during, or after the cancer diagnosis. So these are some of the examples. Sweet syndrome, pruritus, perineoplastic pemphigus, ichthyosis, etc. You can pause the video here, have a look, go through everything in detail. Okay, so vascular ones. Leukocytic vasculitis, polyarthritis, nodosa, Raynaud's syndrome, erythromelalgia. Now, evaluation and diagnosis. Okay, so we characterize the abnormality and obtain the laboratory studies and biopsy as a as necessary. Then we carefully elicit any additional symptoms and signs. We eliminate the common causes, and if there is no obvious etiology, consider a perineoplastic syndrome. If findings are consistent with a known syndrome, we screen for underlying malignancy. Now, if signs and symptoms are consistent with the known perineoplastic syndrome, then we undertake a search for an unknown primary cancer or recurrence or progression of a known primary tumor. Screening should include a careful physical examination, including breast gynecology and prostate evaluations. Basic hematology, chemistry, and urine studies should be done. We should get a chest x-ray and a mammogram. CT of abdomen and pelvis is indicated if there are any suspicious symptom signs or lab abnormalities.